And now, broadcasting live from the restaurant at the end of the universe, this is the history of the Atlantic world. <laughs> And what I say, the captain is a tyrant and I no longer obey. I'm sick of taking orders from the madman in command. So let's stop him on an island and leave him in the sand. Cause it's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. And I will take it over the ship. It's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. Hello it's a mutiny. and welcome. I'm Jesse Weeks. Thank you for joining me. This is the history of the Atlantic world, and this episode is our third and final installment to our introductory series. Uh, now, the bulk of this episode is basically the result of what happened when I was unleashed on a colonial historic site. I read and researched like crazy, and then I proceeded to tell the guests of Wormslow about all the neat things I was learning about the site and about colonial savannah in general. Um, and, in fact... I have accumulated enough knowledge uh, that before I began this podcast, my initial project was was th- collecting these stories. Uh, I initially thought I might uh, write a book, um, but then I realized I could force more people, probably, to hear me tell these stories, which I'm really excited about talking about if, if, I, if, if I started a podcast. Uh, at any rate, um, now, if, if I hadn't already mentioned this, I studied history in college basically for two reasons. The first was that I made up a list that included every major that did not require calculus, and I picked from there. The second reason was because of a story I heard on uh, the first or maybe the second day of my first uh, history class at the University of Georgia, when uh, Dr. Michael Winship Uh, told uh, us undergrads a story that I told in the actual introduction uh, about a war that decided whether or not the new colony of what is now called Georgia was going to be a part of South Carolina or whether it was going to be a part of Florida. In the introductory episode, I tell that story, and and I highly recommend you check that out if you uh, have not listened to that. Um, Now, I studied history in large part because I wanted to read and hear about a lot more of these sorts of stories that I heard uh, from Dr. Winship. Uh, And after graduating, I became employed by the Department of uh, the Georgia, excuse me, the Georgia Department of Natural Resources as a park ranger at uh, Wormslow State Historic Site, a plantation and fort that belonged to one of the original colonists of the city of Savannah, Georgia. Uh, And there, I got to further explore coastal Georgia's heritage. Now, today's episode is a little different than any other we're ever going to have, I think. Um, And that's because I've told everything I'm going to... Well, all these different stories uh, that I'm going to tell you here, I've told them all before. Some of them a hundred times. Uh, some of them thousands of times, um, and to thousands upon thousands of people. Um, at any rate, this is the first time, though, that I've collected them all, I think, and, and, and made anybody listen to all of them all at once. Um, and so with that said, it's a great honor for me to introduce to you Colonial Georgia, the last of England's 13 colonies. Now, in 1733... 119 colonists stepped off the HMS Anne and climbed atop the sandy bluff that would soon become the new city of Savannah. They were met led by a man named James Edward Oglethorpe. And before we go any farther into this story, I think I need to talk about him specifically. Oglethorpe was born in London in 1696, and he grew up to become a man of the Enlightenment. He was elected to Parliament and 
In his early life, his most notable achievement, uh, I would say, would be the passage of laws which reformed debtors' prisons in England. Now, up to and during the 18th century, uh, it was customary uh, in England that if you fell behind on your bills, uh, there was a good chance you were going to, after that, be jailed in debtors' prison. And once there, uh, hopefully for you, you would have a wealthy friend or someone willing to lend you some money because otherwise you were going to die there, probably. Um, that's exactly what happened to a friend of Oglethorpe's, a man named James Castle, who fell into debt, landed in prison, and within six months was dead of disease. Uh, these two men were friends, and Oglethorpe was really affected by this. And so later when he became uh, able to, he, that, that was really what encouraged him to pass uh, or to to work towards passing these debtors' uh, prison reform laws. And later, when he becomes involved with a group called the Georgia Trustees, who have already been envisioning a new colony in North America, um, Oglethorpe's passions continue, and this becomes a big part of the mission of the Georgia Trust, and especially so because Oglethorpe uh, was the only one of the Georgia trustees, and essentially, I want to, the Georgia trustees is basically, it's like an early corporation, a group of, of, of wealthy men who are, who are contributing and, uh, to financially, uh, to this colony, and in fact would be running it, or sort of like an early corporation town, um, at any rate. Oglethorpe was very much responsible for many of the Enlightenment-era ideals uh, that were uh, imparted on the new Georgia colony. Now, Oglethorpe especially envisioned Georgia to be a place where the, uh, what he would call the worthy poor uh, could live, where families from England could get a new start, become yeomen farmers and productive members of society. He viewed in slavery uh, as an intolerable part of, of Georgia's society as, as such. Um, Georgia was going to be a place where men and women would diligently live lives with considerable amounts of Protestant work ethic. Now, the idea of slavery in Georgia basically made Oglethorpe envision prior debtors drinking rum while their slaves worked off their debt, and this is not what he had in, in mind. Um, and so the prohibition against slavery in Georgia wasn't exactly in effect for the good of the enslaved Africans as much it wa as it was uh, in effect for the, uh, for the moral good of the colonists. Now, that the provisions in Georgia, uh, in, in jo early Georgia law forbidding slavery, ultimately failed were not at all helped by Oglethorpe's other obsession, which was obtaining honor, fortune, and glory by going to war with Spain. Now, my first manager at Wormslow actually called Oglethorpe. Uh, he quoted Charlie Murphy uh, and said that Oglethorpe was a habitual line stepper. Now, Oglethorpe spent 10 years in Georgia, but he spent almost no time in Savannah, uh, the city he founded, uh, especially not making sure the colony functioned smoothly. Instead, he spent the bulk of that decade building forts farther and farther south, stopping after each construction was finished, and basically poking his head out of the fort to see what reaction he had provoked out of the Spaniards in Florida. And in fact, Oglethorpe was promoted to general as a result of the victory in the War of Jenkins' Ear. But still, I think those commendations must have felt at least somewhat incomplete, knowing his utopian vision ultimately failed. Now, the Georgia colony was excep exceptional in many ways from the rest of British North America. She is the youngest of all the 13 original colonies, and the only British colony in North America founded in the 18th century. Savannah was the first planned city in North America, founded in 1733 under the financial direction of the Georgia trustees. Um, and as such, Georgia was not a royal colony, but a trust colony. 
And the Georgia trustees, with their Enlightenment ideals, they were put to the test in colonial Georgia. Some of the trustees' ideas worked, others did not. And although James Oglethorpe was the only trustee to ever visit Georgia, the impact of the Georgia Trust on Georgia history has been immense. Now, like I said earlier, the Georgia Trust was essentially an early corporation. Now, Savannah and other early settlements in Georgia were run as company towns. The trustees wanted Georgia to be a place where the worthy poor could improve themselves by becoming land-holding yeoman farmers in congruence with the empire's economic policy of mercantilism. The colonists of Georgia were directed to produce commodities that were not already inside of Britain's sphere of influence, specifically wine and silk. Now, unfortunately for the trust, neither silk nor wine flourished in Georgia. And in fact, the crop yields in the colony were so meager during the early colonial period that the trust, that the largest export out of Georgia at the end of the trustees period, in 1750, the largest export out of Georgia was cedar shingles. Um, well, the squares of downtown Savannah were specifically designed for several reasons. Now, if you're not aware, downtown Savannah is divided into squares to this day that were, were designed by the trustees. The squares spread the city out, and uh, in part that acts as a defensive mechanism from fire. Uh, in addition, they provided safe space for farmers in outlying areas uh, to camp in in case of Spanish invasion. The squares were also common spaces that were used for leisure activities such as games of cricket and common grazing areas for livestock. Um, and, of course, for hangings. Now, the Savannah Plan that James Oglethorpe carried with him was actually designed years before Savannah was founded. In fact, the plan predates the decision to plant Savannah in what is now Georgia. Originally, the plan was to set Savannah down in what is, new, what is now New England, uh, under the name New Azalea. However, colonial royal governors at that time were paid by the acre, and the royal governor of Massachusetts fought pretty hard to keep his colony, and not to mention his paycheck, from being split in half in the 1720s. Just a decade later, though, the relationship between England and Spain had deteriorated to the point that the royal governor of South Carolina was willing to cede his claim on what would become Georgia in order to have a buffer colony between Charleston and St. Augustine. Now, the trustees wished for Georgia to be a utopian society where the worthy poor of London would become prosperous, land-holding freemen who would contribute to the British Empire. And the trustees were very concerned about what effects the, quote, devil's rum, unquote, had on society. So they banned hard spirits. The trustees wanted the colonists to be hard-working, pious people. And so they banned slavery and enforced land restrictions to prevent large estates. The trust also banned lawyers in Georgia. Now, of these four, uh, four restrictions, uh, alcohol, land, slavery, and lawyers... One of those was just as popular and hilarious a decision in the 18th century as it was today. But the Georgia Trust did not ban lawyers from Georgia because it was funny. The trustees knew that the other restrictions would not be very popular with the colonists. The colonists, for their part, were proud English men and women, and they believed they had all the legal rights as such. By banning lawyers... The Georgia trustees barred any of the settlers in Georgia from taking effective legal action to remedy the abridgment of their liberties. Now, that doesn't mean that there weren't settlers who were pretty upset about this. Um, and in fact, they, uh, you can basically uh, divide the early colonists of Georgia into two groups. Um, one 
the group, the worthy poor, the quote unquote worthy poor. Uh, these were people who did not have the money to make the passage, and the trustees paid for their passage. Um, they were basically, in large part, essentially well, indentured servants. Um, and on the other hand, there were some, uh, a smaller number, but, uh, but a still rather sizable, I guess, in comparison to the uh, entire population, a sizable minority um, of colonists who did pay their own passage, who did have some money. And they formed a group, what they called the Malcontents. And the Malcontents um, wrote a number of pieces of literature protesting uh, the, especially the, the land and slavery uh, restrictions in Georgia. Now, with all that said, uh, the Georgia Trust's utopian vision failed. I think you can make a pretty compelling argument. It didn't necessarily fail entirely because it was such an economic disaster. I think you can also say that the Georgia Trust failed because it was a military success. Now, without a military threat against Spain, the Georgia Trust went bankrupt in 1751 when Parliament failed to vote on a subsidy for the colony. After the war um, against Spain, the, the War of Jenkins' Ear, um, there was no more military expenditures bolstering Georgia's economy, and the trustees' noble experiment was essentially over. Slavery and rum flourished in Georgia, which was situated firmly in the transatlantic plantation economy, and once the land restrictions ended, wealthy planters, mostly from Carolina, flooded into Georgia to buy up large tracts of land. Now, James Oglethorpe himself rose to the rank of general, um, as a result of the end of the War of Jenkins' Ears. But just nine years after that, uh, saw his dream of, uh, of, of Georgia being a, a paradise for, uh, uh, for, for, for reform of debtors' prisons. Uh, he would see that fail. Now, before we talk, and I think that, that gives us, a, I guess, a pretty uh, decent understanding uh, I think of of how the colony was formed, um, or the motivations behind it, I guess. And we're gonna get soon. We're gonna turn to life in the colony, which is what the bulk of this episode will be about. But before we do that, I think we need to answer a very uh, important question. And that is this, um, why was there so much land available along the Savannah River? And the Spanish conquistador, Hernando de Soto, is probably the best place to start with that. He is, by the way, I think my favorite, if I can have a favorite conquistador, uh, uh, we're going to be talking about them, I guess, soon enough. But uh, anyway, he stormed through Georgia and the American South during the 1540s. Uh, he brought with him war, famine, and slavery. Uh, smallpox followed immediately in his wake. And as a result, uh, the complete social structure uh, in Georgia collapsed. Uh, the Mississippian chiefdoms and the Native American societies, um, the populations collapsed. Um, and began to reorganize into new political units. Uh, in addition to the smallpox, there was influenza, whooping cough, malaria, yellow fever, scarlet fever, and a host of other diseases that were all brought to the Americas from the New World, uh, or excuse me, uh, from the Old World in the 16th century. Now, the populations of a lot of these places were so ravaged that probably 80 or 90% of the indigenous population in Georgia was killed by old world disease. But that doesn't alone explain why there were so few Yamacraw Indians 
living at the mouth of the Savannah River in 1733, when Tomachichi granted James Oglethorpe a small bluff to begin the construction of the Georgia colony. Now, the reason why only a few people lived along the Savannah River in 1733 is one of the darkest in the history of Georgia. Now, the Yamacraw was a Muskogee-speaking village that came about from the aftermath of the, to quote Jared Diamond, the guns, germs, and steel being brought to the American South. The British named the Muscogee the Creek Indians, and that was because it seemed to the British that the Muscogee people were always around the water. The Native Americans at Yamacraw Village greeted James Oglethorpe and the original settlers in Georgia in 1733 with the hope of developing trade with James Oglethorpe and the other English settlers. Yamacraw was a village of less than 200 individuals but it lay on an important trade route for deerskins since it was on the river. An important, and deerskins were a very important commodity in the 17th and 18th centuries. Now, Tamachichi was at that time the 79-year-old Miko, or chief of the Yamacraw village. Tamachichi had lived through some pretty barbarous times. During the mid to late 17th century, Charleston merchants employed Indian slavers to hunt for people along the Savannah River. When Tomachichi met with James Oglethorpe, he sought to gain access to English goods, especially firearms, to make sure his people could never be taken in this way again. Now, let's, uh, let me go back in time a little bit, I guess. Uh, there's uh, movies like Robin Hood. For example, um, you'll see signs in a lot of medieval movies like this that, that read uh, something like, No hunting in the king's forest. Now, in film, this is often used to show that the, the king, he sure is a real asshole. Uh, and, but in reality, such signs existed in part also as a conservation technique. Now, Europe has been in the age of iron since the days of the Roman Empire. And European forests have been felled at a quicker rate with steel axes and to feed forges to create steel tools as a result. And because of this, there really wasn't enough forested land throughout Europe in the, by the 16th century so that just anybody, anywhere, could just run out into the woods and shoot a deer and eat the deer and make a blanket, for example, out of the, the, the skin. Now, it's a lot colder in Germany than it is in Georgia. And so this trade, the deerskin trade, between Europe and North America flourished in the 17th century. Now, and this especially flourished in the North. And I should also mention, besides deerskins, there are fewer deerskins in, in Georgia, but uh, a lot of beaver pelts and everything like that, too. Um, now, in the north, in the northeast America, English, French, Dutch traders all competed with each other to secure the furs and hides that they would purchase from native hunters. And this gave northern tribes an advantage when trading with whites. Now, in contrast in the south, the Spanish have a, had a monopoly on trade with the Indians um, in large parts of the southeast. And Spanish law forbid the selling of muskets to tribes, and so they were far less common in Georgia during the 17th century. Now, similarly, to the deerskin economy to the south, the beaver pelt economy was so important in North America that, that the, during this time that the Iroquois and Huron Indians went to war over hunting lands around the Great Lakes in the 1640s. The result was that the Iroquois defeated the Hurons, and as a result, the Huron tribes lost access to valuable hunting lands. About 2,000 Hurons migrated south and east after the war, seeking a new way of life. 
They were called the Erie when they left. But by the time they passed through Virginia and made their way south, settling in South Carolina, they were known as the Westo, since they came from the West. And in 1663, a large settlement of Westo Indians were living near Charleston. Now, the Westos had been defeated, but they were still heavily armed and could count on 800 warriors. They formed an evil bargain with the merchants of Charleston. The Westos would go south into Georgia and would hunt for people along the Savannah River. The captured were enslaved, sold in Charleston, and then sold again onto ships headed for plantations in the Caribbean or in Virginia. By 1700, the Savannah River had become almost a no-man's land. Now, Tamachichi founded Yamacraw in 1728 as an aging man, and still remembered fighting for his life and for the lives of his people against the West Coast slavers. When Oglethorpe and the early colonists arrived on the Georgia coast, the aging warrior was happy to deal with Oglethorpe because the new English flintlocks his people could purchase would help ensure their safety. And we're going to see a lot of that as we get going into this. Um, after this episode, we're going to dive into, the, I guess, the main story. And one thing... Uh, that you'll notice is that a, a lot of the gains, the colonial gains that that these European powers are able to make, they, they're not possible except for without at least on some level, on some part of a native society and acceptance of of these of new uh new mercantile relationships now Tamachichi uh let's get back to him though for a second cuz he was the tallest man in the world uh for most people who ever saw him he was an impressive figure um yeah, he founded the Yamacraw village uh, he was the miko or chief there uh, uh and when he died he was buried on in a giant burial mound uh, in what is now right square uh, after having lived a rather exceptionally long uh, life for the era, um, uh, some he could have very well lived. Uh, he might have been in his nineties. Nobody, we're not entirely sure how old he was. Um, he was also six foot seven uh, at the time when the average size of a European of uh, was about five foot six. Um, so, as far as almost anyone who ever came to Georgia uh, was concerned, he was the tallest person in the world. His portrait was taken uh, at some point with his nephew, Tuna Howie, uh, who I kept a bald eagle as a pet. Uh, these two uh, actually traveled to London uh, along with other Muscogee leaders as part of a delegation, the first actual Native American delegation to visit London in about 100 years um, since, since uh, uh, Pocahontas had gone in the 1600s, mind you. Um, at any rate... Um, Tomachichi, uh, his, from his uh, perspective, they wanted to judge the intentions of the English. Uh, for their part, the English wanted to uh, amaze Tomachichi and the others, um, who hoped, th and they hoped that the size of London, which was one of the largest cities in the world and a center of worldwide commerce, would would show Tomachichi that, and the other Muscogee leaders that. Uh, the obvious benefits of entering into this relationship uh, with with England. Now, after showing these uh, Muscogee men and women uh, the the splendor of London, um, showing them the superiority of English ways, when the Georgia trustees toured the old Miko. Uh, through the city and afterwards asked him what he thought. They said, Damachichi, have you ever seen such splendor? Damachichi replied, I see that this city is very dirty, 
and I do not understand why you Englishmen wish to live in such a dirty place. London was severely overcrowded during the 18th century, and this made the city a very dirty, smelly place. And especially, I can't imagine what it would have been like for country folk like Tamachichi, <laughs> uh, accustomed to natural surroundings, uh, accustomed to smelling, you know, plants, <laughs> river, and smell, instead smelling, you know, human feces. And, uh, very different. The Muskogee saw the world in a different way than the English did. And so Tamachichi pitied the people of London, so removed from the wilderness and their massively urban environment. But neither did the English really understand Muskogee culture. They called the Muskogees the creeks because they were near the water. The Muskogees believed that evil, invisible particles or atoms basically floated around the universe and that these sinful atoms were constantly getting on you and making you not just dirty, but I mean, spiritually unclean. So the Muskogees bathed every day for religious purposes. And now the English thought this was very strange. The Muskogees thought the English were very smelly. In addition, the Muskogees went to sweat lodges, which operated similarly to modern-day saunas. Uh, the Muskogees likewise did this to sweat out the evil toxins that they believed were getting into their pores. Um, Muskogee family structure was was radically different than, than the English uh, Muskogee families were matrilineal, and so Muskogee ch children were raised by their biological mother mothers in homes that were apart from their biological fathers, who were regarded more like uncles in, uh, in Western society. Um, the father figure in the Muskogee homes was fulfilled by the, bi the biological mother's brother or brothers instead. Now this may seem very strange to you, but that is why Tamachichi was got his portrait taken with his nephew instead of his son. Now, I had a lot of fun playing catch with my dad as a kid. I wouldn't trade those memories for anything in the world. But I guess it would have been pretty fun to play catch with my two uncles, too. That would have been pretty cool. Anyway, not every difference between English colonists and Muscogee natives was bewildering. Uh, some were very understandable and, uh, and welcome. In fact, once a year, Tamachichi showed up in Savannah with a gift for everyone, and essentially the city had two Christmases for this. Um, the term potluck comes from an old uh, Indian word uh, from, I think, from the West Coast, meaning potlash, which means to give away. Mikos and other wealthy Muskogees did uh, display their wealth in such a fashion by holding a potlash and giving everyone in town a gift. This made Tamachichi especially beloved by the people of Savannah. Likewise, the colonists depended on Tamachichi and the Yamacraw Indians for aid when it came to farming. During the trustee period from 1733 to 1751, nearly all the colonists came from London, one of the largest cities in the world. Now, most colonists were poor farmers. And the Yamacraw, and I don't mean poor as in they had no money, although they were, I mean poor as in they were terrible farmers. Uh, the Yamacraw taught the colonists about what they called the Three Sisters, which was corn, beans, and squash which are New World crops that grow very well together. Corn stalks shoot up very quickly, and this provides a lattice for, beans to sh to, for bean shoots to likewise climb upwards. Um, both of these plants, meanwhile, uh, take nitrogen out of the soil, though, and that's where the squash comes in. You plant your squash around your beans and your corn, and squash replenishes nitrogen in the soil. Um, you know, the three sisters even grow in sandy soil, um, which is pretty much everywhere around coastal Georgia. 
So the people of, of, of Georgia um, were pretty heavy-hearted when Tomichichi died in 1739, buried under a great burial mound that was over two stories tall. And the mound was a testament to his work, building a friendship between Yamacraw and Savannah. But unfortunately, his mound was desecrated. It is no longer there. Grave diggers in the late 1800s began digging up, looking for his treasure. And the last straw, I mean, what could only happen, I guess, in America. In 1883, railroad tycoon William Gordon bulldozed the mound and built an obelisk atop of it, celebrating the railroad. <laughs> ah, well, at any rate, Gordon's daughter-in-law, Nellie Gordon, probably worried about, you know, disturbing Indian burial grounds and whatnot, helped fund the purchase and transport of a large granite boulder from uh, the Atlanta area to sit aside the monument and mark the bulldozed gravesite of Tomichichi. Uh, now, in the years after Tomichichi's death, European settlers continued to pour into Georgia, and they slowly pushed most Native Americans out. Only a century later, the Trail of Tears actually begun, began here. So Tamachichi's dream of a peaceful future for his people was not to be. Um, at any rate, uh, I don't mean to get that far into the future. <clears throat> but uh, it's one of the, I, I think, one of the great tragedies of, of Georgia, uh, certainly of the United States, and, and really all all of the, the, the European colonization uh, efforts. Uh, I guess there's obviously two great, great sins of, of the past for Western culture. Um, slavery and, uh, and what I think should best be described as the genocide of Native Americans. <clears throat> At any rate, we have plenty of time for me to convince you of that, I suppose, or anger you with it. Uh, but for right now, I want to talk a little bit more before I get off the subject about Muscogee religion, uh, and specifically about uh, the, the only caffeinated plant indigenous to North America. It's a very flexible tree called Yopon Holly. Um, and because it's so flexible, it was regularly used by both the settlers and Native Americans for woodworking projects. Uh, the, the leaves of Yopon Holly, though, this is where the real treat is. They could be dry roasted and boiled to make tea. In fact, Yopon Holly tea is delicious. I myself have brewed Yopon Holly tea, though I was a little bit nervous. It was delicious, and I highly recommend you trying some as soon as possible. Do not at all be frightened by the fact that the scientific name of Yopan Holly is Ilex vomitoria. It has a very bad reputation. Now, the Muscogee Indians made tea out of Yopan Holly, but the tea that the Muscogee brewed was very different than what you are probably used to. And that's because the Muscogees brewed Yopan Holly tea all day and all night. They put more and more dry, roasted holly leaves into the evaporating water. And the next day, the drink was extremely potent. It was so dark, it was called black drink. And so infused with caffeine that one cup of black drink was the equivalent of about 27 cups of coffee. Now, if you drank black drink, you would throw up. So, very similar to uh, your early 20s, I would imagine. But the Muscogees ingested and then eat but they ingested and then, uh, and then vomited black drink for religious purposes. Now, if you believe in the invisible evil particles that the Muscogees believed were constantly getting on your skin and making you need to bathe every day, one day while eating breakfast, you might make a terrifying revelation. Oh, no you might exclaim, 
I think I've been swallowing the evil particles. How in the hell am I ever going to get to heaven? The answer being, yes, of course you are swallowing the evil particles, and you'd better get them out if you want to go to heaven. Now, the Muskogees drank black drink for the same reason they bathed every day. Now, mind you, they did not drink the black drink every day. Now, of course, the Muskogees did not give Yopon Holly a Yopon Holly a Latin name. The name Ilex vomitoria gets its roots from the colonial period. Nowadays, we believe that you should be able to buy pretty much whatever you want from pretty much wherever you want. You know, a free market. But in the years before the American Revolution, the economic rule of the day was mercantilism instead of a free market. Many goods purchased in the British colonies in North America were by law to be required to be purchased from specific companies in England that had the government contracts necessary to legally trade in the colonies. Iron and coal were two industries in particular that were booming in England at this era, and no coal mines or iron foundries were legal in North America. Fine clothing, furniture, even some foodstuffs were likewise regulated. The British East India Company, for example, sold tea. They had no interest in colonists walking out to their backyards and picking out tea leaves and brewing their own tea, so they named the Yopon Highly Ilex Vomitoria. And you better believe they told everybody that would listen not to drink it. Now, a early case of corporate sabotage, really. <clears throat> now, a key event in Georgia's history we're kind of skipping over um, or avoiding a little bit, and that's because, uh, well, we'll get to that at the end of the episode, uh, podcast, but the, the war of, of Jenkins' year. Now, when news of the war spread, most um, of the colonists fled. Um, or, well, they would, co well, mo they moved. Um, although back then they would actually say, I quit. You know, they, I have quit my land and embarking north. Most went to Carolina and settled in or around Charleston, although some with more resources quit further north than that. But one family did not quit. They were headed by Noble Jones, who, by the war's end, was the last of the original colonists who had arrived on the HMS Anne, still living in Savannah. Exceptional in many ways from his contemporaries in early Savannah, Jones's fortified tabby home protected Savannah from the south against potential Spanish invasion from St. Augustine. Noble Jones was a carpenter born on the English Wales border in 1702 and emigrated with his wife, Sarah, and their son, Noble Wimberley, to Savannah aboard the HMS Anne along with James Oglethorpe in 1733. Now, Jones and his family were one of only three families aboard that original ship who had paid their own passage. And as such, Noble was given 500 acres of land which was ten times that which the worthy poor who could not pay their passage were given. Um, the Georgia Trust divided the 1,500-acre island, the Isle of Hope, into three plantations, and Noble Jones obtained the southern third of this island, which was situated upon an important waterway that led to Savannah from the south. Now, his plantation's name was Wormslow, and it derived from a place name on the English Wales border where he grew up as a child. And he also paid for the passage of two additional families on the trip, and these two households were indentured to him as a result. While in Georgia, he served as a captain in Oglethorpe's 42nd Regiment of Foot, uh, and in total, three families lived at Wormslow, and ten British Marines were stationed there as well. And so Wormslow Plantation was as much a military outpost as it was country estate, until at least until the conclusion of the War of Jenkins' Ear. 
Now, Jones held many titles during his life in Georgia. In addition to Marine, he was constable, doctor for a time, Indian agent, planter, royal counselor, and a surveyor of the towns of Augusta and New Ebenezer. Now, Captain Jones finished the nine-mile-long Skedaway Road, which ran from Savannah to the Isle of Hope in 1736, and just two years later, news reached Savannah that England had declared war on Spain. Jones' land sat on an important waterway called Jones Narrows, which served as the main passage of water that led to Savannah from the south, and it was assumed that if the Spanish attacked, they would attempt to sneak through this back river channel to get to Savannah undetected. Now, which, and uh, j specifically Jones' Land, I should say, uh, in a sailboat would be about two hours from downtown Savannah. Now, so thus, Oglethorpe tasked Jones with guarding the waterway at the opening of the War of Jenkins' Ear, and it was for this reason Jones began construction of the fortified home. Now, Jones's tabby fort <clears throat> uh, was made. A tabby is a construction. It's basically also, mind you, a concrete made out of oyster shells, uh, where bricks uh, are cement is mixed with whole oyster shells to create bricks. Uh, the lime is actually made by burning and crushing oyster shells, and so there's an awful lot of oysters built in the, in the process. Um, and to construct these, Jones and other colonists mined giant, ancient, uh, old shell middens that dotted uh, the American seacoast that were left by uh, Native American hunter-gatherers for the materials. Um, and any, anyway, uh, Jones's uh, midden was about 50 yards from the location from his fort. Um, so the materials he used were very local, costed him almost nothing, uh, except for the time and labor it took to build the fort. With that said, uh, it took uh, quite a long time to build the fort. Now, in addition, tabby is a material more malleable than brick or stone, uh, an 18th century cannon will punch holes in a brick wall. A stone wall will last a good deal longer, but eventually stone will crumble to 18th century artillery. Tabby crumples instead. So cannonballs literally sink into a tabby structure. The goal being, of course, that if you were inside a tabby fort, which is under siege, and you start running out of ammunition, you can send somebody who is really fast outside to pry a few cannonballs out, and then you shoot them back at whoever is shooting them at you. Um, and, I, and I say it took Jones a while to build this little fort. It took him six years to finish the construction, which is quite unfortunate, because the War of Jenkins here was only five years long. Uh, but that's the way life goes sometimes. Now, on the other hand, Jones's house was the size of a two-car garage, which made it twice the size of the second largest house in Savannah. At 32 by 36 feet, and with a large L-shaped loft, Noble Jones had the biggest house in Savannah in 1743, by a long shot. Now, the Spanish never did attack the city, which is great for us, since we still get to you know, explore the place. And it was also good for Noble Jones, even if, even if he had finished the construction of his fortified home in advance. Captain Jones's fort was rather small, and it would have hardly have stood up in a prolonged battle. There were only 14 fighting men at Wormslow, Noble and his oldest son, Noble Wimberley, and his two male head of household indentured servants, and his ten marines. And Noble would have had an, been an awful amount of trouble if a Spanish warship with, say, 200 soldiers and 10 cannon had ever showed up. Noble, his son, and his friends, in that case, likely would have been toast in such an event. But the goal of Noble Jones's Tabby Fort was never to stop the Spanish from invading just nine miles south of Savannah. The goal of the Tabby Fort was to slow the Spanish down. Skedaway Road led all the way from the fort nine miles to downtown Savannah, where passersby would be dropped off about 
two blocks south of where the pirate's house sits today. And if the Spanish ever attacked, Noble's younger son, Inigo Jones, who was 11 years old, would have hopped on a horse, galloped those nine miles, and would have been screaming, the Spanish are coming, the Spanish are coming. That young lad would have had the most important job in all of the city had an invasion ever occurred. Now, I also said that that's for, Noble Jones was for some time a doctor, which was not by design. A doctor uh, came along the boat uh, in 1733, uh, but he was the very first colonist to die. And this very much worried the rest of the settlers who were plagued by a variety of ills. 18th century people knew nothing about germs, and as a result, drinking water was dangerous in colonial Savannah. Neither did the colonists understand that mosquitoes could spread disease. Yellow fever and malaria were endemic to Georgia by the founding of Savannah. Uh, disease could bring death very quickly in the 18th century. The well in Savannah was fouled with dysentery almost immediately. And it can be argued that disease has had a larger impact on Savannah than really almost anything else. Re I mean, greater than the revolution, uh, greater even than, than chattel slavery and the plantation economy. Uh, and this impact can be seen in, seen in colonial Savannah. Only months after the colonists landed, the doctor died of dysentery. Now, with that said, doctors in the 18th century did not undergo, of course, the type of standardized training uh, that doctors get today, and some of them didn't undergo really training, uh, standardized training of any type at all. And so the doctor dying, for all I know, might have very well not have been a bad thing at all. Uh, and that's because 18th century doctors used a variety of techniques to aid or not aid their patients. Some of these techniques were very helpful. Others were pure quackery. Uh, many doctors believed that all illnesses were a result of inequality of the four humors. And imagine getting sick with the flu and having your doctor bleed you with leeches or by simply cutting into a vein with a knife. It can certainly be more difficult to recover from an illness with someone draining the T-cells right out of your circulatory system. Uh, worse were many of the tonics and cures prescribed by these so-called physicians, which often contained heavy metals like lead or mercury. As a result, 18th century patients who were ill with disease, disease, mind you, had a better chance of recovery if they stayed at home and didn't visit the doctor. Nevertheless, the people of Savannah were rather concerned when they discovered that the doctor had passed away, but lucky for them, Noble Jones had served as a surgeon's assistant in his past. He had helped deliver a baby. Mr. Jones was a well-trained carpenter and well as well, and this made him great with a saw. Physical injuries often resulted in amputation in the 18th century. There were no painkillers during this era, except for hard spirits. And so patients were lucky to have someone like Noble Jones act as a doctor in the event of amputation being necessary. Since Noble Jones banned hard spirits in Georgia, not every amputee got to have a f even a few sips of rum or whiskey. Noble Jones' best skill as a doctor was that since he was a doc since he was a carpenter, he was a good man with a saw, and in the absence of other pleasantries like painkillers or a working knowledge of disease, at least Noble Jones's patients got to experience the blessing of a quickly sawed off arm or leg. Luckily for Savannah, Noble Jones did not serve long as the colony's doctor. Six months later, uh, after Georgia was founded, a ship, the William and Mary, arrived bearing a doctor. He even had a tonic that promised to ease the symptoms of yellow fever. Unfortunately, the 42 colonists aboard the William and Sarah were not allowed to come ashore when they arrived. And that's because even though Savannah was a city of the Enlightenment, even the Enlightened thinkers of the 18th century could be sometimes bigoted, and the colonists aboard the William and Sarah were Jewish. There's no Jews and there's no Catholics allowed in Georgia, said the dockmaster when the William and Sarah arrived in Georgia. All but eight 
of the 42 colonists aboard the ship were both Jewish and Spanish, a fact that made them even more suspicious. The people of Savannah did not trust these newcomers, so they did not allow them to land. Less than a year into the opening of Savannah, and the opening of the Georgia colony was entirely at risk because of prejudice. Now, let's go back in time a little bit. Uh, if we were around in 1492, we would think that Columbus reaching the Caribbean was probably the third most important thing that had happened in Spain that year. Um, Granada, southern Spain, the last Muslim kingdom of Spain at that point, also fell in 1492. And with King Philip of Aragon and Queen Isabella of Castile recently married, uh, the kingdom of Spain had become one political entity that was radically more, or radically, that was much more important uh, at the time. Now, the other big news in 1492 was the expulsion of the Jews. At the time, perhaps 10% of the Jewish population was Jewish. Philip and Isabella expelled the population, which is a tragic incident that we'll later be getting into. Uh, but And this forced many Jewish families inside of Spain to make a painful decision. Either they would be forced to leave and find a new life elsewhere, leaving everything behind, or they could convert to Christianity. Now, by converting, Jews were able to retain control of their property. These converts were called conversos. Now, of course... Many of the people who chose to become conversos only really paid some lip service to their new religion and continued to secretly practice their own culture. As a result, many were repeatedly subjected to the terror of the Spanish Inquisition. Now, 34 conversos who left Spain and Portugal in 1733 and headed to the New World were called Sephardic Jews. And since 1492, they and their ancestors had been living publicly as Catholics in Portugal and Spain, while in private they continued their Jewish faith. One of these 34 colonists was Dr. Samuel Nunoz Ribeiro, a practicing physician who was able to boast that he had a tonic which eased the symptoms of yellow fever, which was the most deadly and one of the most common of all the diseases that plagued Georgia. Dr. Nunoz had previously stood trial in Spain under an inquisitorial court. Stories like his had spurred the Jewish population of London, which was about 6,000, to raise money for some of their less fortunate brothers and sisters of the faith to travel to North America seeking asylum. Once the people of Savannah discovered that Dr. Nunoz was on board the William and Mary, they basically changed their minds about wanting the Sephardic Jews in Georgia. Please come here, they begged. And don't forget Dr. Nunoz. Now, together, these new immigrants founded Congregation Mikveh Israel, along with two, the two Jewish families from London, the Minnis and Sheftal families who traveled along with them. Now, Congregation Mikveh Israel is the third oldest Jewish congregation in the United States. The synagogue sits at 20 East Gordon Street on Monterey Square in downtown Savannah, and inside, and I'm telling you all of this because I, you should go inside, it's one of the oldest artifacts inside the city of Savannah. The Jewish colonists in Savannah brought with them a, a Sefer Torah made of deer skin. Now, a Sefer Torah is a copy of the Torah, which was secretly written down on deer skin leather in the late 15th century uh, because in the 1400s, it was illegal for Jews to buy paper in Spain. You know, they could have been writing down their secret plans on there or something. As a result, they bought leather and wrote on that because the purchase could be excused for as for other reasons. Now, that Torah is today still on display at Congregation McVeigh Israel, um, and I think it's worth checking out. Anyway, um, I also want to speak specifically about one of those... Uh, those uh, colonists, uh, Mordecai Sheftal. He was born in Savannah, Georgia on December 2nd, 1735. His parents had arrived on the William and Sarah just two years earlier, and he was quite a prodigy. 
Uh, although his formal education ended at the age of 11, he was a skilled merchant, and by the time he was 17, he was buying and tanning deer skins for a profit. At just 18 years old, he had enough money to purchase 50 acres of land south of Savannah at the Vernonburg River. Now, this was just the beginning for young Mordecai. He speculated in land and owned over 2,000 acres by the time he was 30. He took up cattle ranching, too. Because of this, opened up a tannery with his brother Levi. The Georgia House of Assembly even named Mordecai Inspector of Tanned Leather to the Port of Savannah in 1768. And he was one of the most influential and successful merchants during the later half of the 18th century. But he was a vocal opponent of the Stamp Act and other taxes levied by England uh, uh, against the American colonies during the 1760s. And unfortunately for him, most of his wealth and property vanished as a result of the American Revolution. Um, At any rate... uh, I mentioned something earlier I want to get back to, too, uh, the Pirate's House. Um, It's Savannah's most famous restaurant, uh, without a doubt. At night, costume pirates greet and joke with guests who learn about the pirates' interesting past as they delight in some of the best uh, crab stew the city has to offer, really, if you ask me. Um, Now, purportedly, the Pirate House is named because of a pirate the name there. As the story goes, Captain Flint a pirate made famous in Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, uh, became, uh, he, well, he, he, he died there. Uh, there was also, there's also supposedly tunnels that exist uh, underneath the pirate house where pirates once shanghaied uh, people and took them out to sea. Um, I've even heard it claimed that the pirate's house is the oldest standing structure in Georgia and dates back to the very founding of the city. Uh, This is all true, and this is all false. (laughs) How is this possible, you might ask? Well, uh, the real story of the Pirate House goes back to the founding of Georgia. Oglethorpe and the trustees set aside 10 acres of land just east of Savannah as the Trustees' Garden which was a piece of land designated for experimentation, where the people of Georgia could go to learn about what sort of crops they could grow there uh, on their land. The trustees' garden thus grew a variety of different crops. Um, Now, the trustees believed Savannah had a subtropical climate, and so they tasked Joseph Fitzwalter uh, to grow a variety of crops. The most important to the trustees were white mulberry trees for silk production and imported grapes for the production of wine. But Phillips Walter also experimented with a number of other crops for agricultural, industrial, and medicinal purposes. Olives, oranges, cotton, and capers they were all tried as potential cash crops. So too was hops for beer production and flax and hemp for naval rigging. Jesuit bark was planted because of its use in fighting malaria. Coconut was planted for red dye production and indigo for blue dye production. Unfortunately for Fitzwalter, the Georgia trustees and the poor colonists of Georgia, the, um, the, the garden was a failure, unfortunately, excuse me. For starters, the climate was different than what the trustees had imagined. Savannah's climate is quite warm, but it still suffered through freezes during the winter, and in the spring the climate can be rather erratic. Now, to further complicate matters, the soils of coastal Georgia are very sandy and somewhat acidic. Many of the imported crops would not grow in the low country. Further, the Georgia colony suffered from a labor shortage. Few potential settlers were willing to relocate to a brand new colony when better opportunities often presented themselves in Georgia's 12 older siblings. One other factor uh, that prevented the uh, cultivation of crops, perhaps more than any other, was the inexperience of the colonists themselves. The original colonists in Georgia all came from within London, one of the largest urban spaces in the world. This was almost as true in the 18th century as it is today. Of the 119 original colonists, only Joseph Fitzwalter had any previous experience putting his hands in the soil as a farmer. He worked as a gardener in London, 
When he arrived in Savannah, Fitzwalter became the gardener. The other colonists were hardworking people. They were excellent carpenters and blacksmiths and tailors and brick masons. They could shoe horses and sew wigs and blow glass, but they were not farmers. Imagine dumping all of your life savings into an agricultural business. Imagine purchasing a piece of land on the coast of Africa and then going to New York City, finding 150 people to work for you and then moving them there. Imagine how poorly they would fare at farming. Now, it should be easy for you to imagine why the Georgia Trust went bankrupt in less than 20 years and Georgia became a royal colony. You know, shortly after the Trust failed, the 10 acres east of Savannah was transformed from gardens to residential areas. Though today the squares of the Eastern Historic District contain some of the most expensive homes in all of the city, this was not so during the 18th century. By the 1750s, Savannah was a growing port city, and the land near the pirate house was a rambunctious place filled with sailors, Irish, and other indentured servants, and free blacks. Savannah's old east side was a rough and tumble place at times. It stood in stark contrast to the well-ordered squares just to the west. It was in this climate that a certain Mr. Brown purchased Joseph Fitzwalter's house and shop which was called the Herb House. Mr. Brown expanded the Herb House into a much larger inn in 1754. The Herb House is still a part of the Pirate House, and that room is the oldest standing structure in Georgia. Now, little is known of Mr. Brown, save that he was a retired pirate who used his ill-gotten gains to purchase the land and build the inn. He was married to a fr free black woman who on more than one occasion apparently hit Mr. Brown with a firing, frying pan, or as I like to say, you know, the sort of thing you would have to do if you were married to a pirate. Now, Brown named the inn after himself, Brown's Tavern, and it was a very popular destination for working people in Savannah and sailors coming in from the port. Now, the stories of the tunnels underneath the pirate's house are also true, but it is extremely unlikely that any pirates actually shanghaied anyone out of Savannah. First off, piracy paid well enough that very few pirate ships ever needed to practice disreputable hiring practices. Second, piracy was largely suppressed in the 1720s, a decade before the founding of Georgia. It is further impossible for the tunnels underneath the a pirate house to have been a hiding spot for illegal rum during the trustee period. The reason for this is simple. Brown's Tavern did not exist until after the trustee period was over. Now, if piracy and illegal booze were not the reasons for the tunnels underneath the pirate house, what was? Well, shanghaiing of sailors was quite prevalent. It just wasn't pirates who were doing the shanghaiing. The reason so many were eager to mutiny and go on the account and become pirates in the 18th century, in case you didn't catch last episode, is because pirates in the merchant marine and sailors in the navy alike were generally treated horribly. Merchant captains had near unlimited power on the high seas and were free to beat, starve, maroon, or just not pay sailors which they did not agree with who did not work hard enough, or for whatever other reason a captain might have for mistreating his sailors. Now, pay for sailors was slightly better in the Navy, but the treatment might not have been. Further, the work was often much more dangerous. As a result, numerous merchant marine captains and Navy captains resorted to a variety of nefarious techniques to fill out their crews. The shanghaiing of American sailors by the British Navy was, in fact, one of the key reasons for the start of the War of 1812. Now, ultimately, however, the shanghaiing of sailors out of Savannah, then, is no more responsible for the naming of the Pirate House than Mr. Brown, and that's because the origin of the name Pirate House comes from Captain Flint, made fi famous by Treasure Island, written by Robert Louis Stevenson. Now, Stevenson was the Stephen King of, <clears throat> excuse me, the Stephen King of the 19th century. In the years after the publication of Treasure Island, 
It became popular for early tourists of Savannah to ask locals, where can I find that pirate's house? According to Stevenson, Captain Flint even died in Savannah, and many people believe that the exact location of Captain Flint's death when it's in his room on the second floor of Brown's Tavern. There are even ghost stories that detail how Flint himself is haunting the restaurant to this day. However, since Captain Flint is a fictional character and did not actually die in Savannah, his ghost is almost certainly does not haunt the pirate house. <laughs> Put that on the record. Still, I think we should be thankful for Stevenson's creation. If not for Captain Flint having inhabited an actual pirate's house in Savannah, nobody would have ever asked, where is that pirate's house? And nobody then would have ever gotten the idea, hey, I should build that old building that everybody keeps asking about and start selling things there. At any rate, we wouldn't be able to sit down in the herb room of the pirate's house today and order a bowl of crab stew. Now, with all of that said, the strangest thing that ever took place at the pirate house was back before it was the pirate house when it was the trustee's garden. Back then, livestock were allowed to freely range in the squares of downtown Savannah, all the way, really, until the early 20th century. And this was so widely practiced during the colonial era that a common expression was that farmers needed a fence that was horse-high, bull-strong, and pig-tight to keep animals out of their farms. As you might imagine, this could cause some friction between neighbors. Believe it or not, the strangest incident to ever take place at the pirate's house has nothing to do with pirates, novelists, and nobody gets shanghaied. In fact, it predates Brown's taverns altogether. It was back in the time of Joseph Fitzwalter, and he had a problem. See, the neighbor of the trustee's gardens... Excuse me. The trustee's gardener's neighbor, named Robert Williams had goats. And one of Mr. Williams' goats, in particular, was of notable strength and intellect. The beast in question was large and strong enough that the animal simply jammed its horns into the gates of fences, wiggled them around, and since it was so big and strong, just backed up, beep, 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 after the horns were locked into place and the gate would rip open and a herd of goats would proceed to eat everything inside of the fenced area. Now this happened twice at the trustee's garden. The first time, Joseph Fitzwalter and Robert Williams were able to remove the herd before the damage was severe. But the second time was a bigger problem. And Robert Williams wasn't in Savannah at the time. He had gone shopping, which meant he'd gone to Charleston. And at this time, his goats broke into Fitzwalter's garden a second time. Fitzwalter knew which animal was responsible. It was furious. And when he saw the animals feasting upon his labor, and seeing that that big billy goat responsible pulling his gate down still had two planks stuck around one of his horns. And this was the second time that Joseph Fitzwalter had seen Williams' herd of goats chomping on his crops. Well, Mr. Fitzwalter picked up his brown Bess, stepped to the offending animal, fired old Bessie, and put her down. Problem solved, said Mr. Fitzwalter. Now, for his part, Robert Williams did not think the problem was solved when he returned to Savannah and discovered his prized goat was dead. He was furious. Imagine if you returned home from vacation and discovered your neighbor had smashed your boat into pieces. Mr. Williams was determined to get revenge. He knew that Fitzwalter kept geese, and so Williams took out his best and began to fire. Three geese had already perished when a concerned neighbor asked Robert Williams what he was doing. I'm killing Mr. Fitzwalter's geese because he shot my goat, he declared with passion. 
but Mr. Williams. The geese you were killing belonged to Mrs. Vanderplank, Williams' neighbor replied. Everybody in town that day had a great chuckle and a free goose dinner. Except for Mr. Williams, who was forced to repay Mrs. Vanderplank for the geese he had shot. Now, he was still also very angry. And the day after that, he went out with his brown bess again. He was more careful, waiting until he saw Mr. Fitzwalter guiding his geese down to the river to feed. Suddenly, Williams ran out from the bushes and fired, killing one of Mr. Fitzwalter's geese. He turned his brown bess around and began to swing it like a club. I'll kill you next, he snarled as he swung with rage at his neighbor. Mr. Williams proceeded to chase Mr. Fitzwalter from the pirate house all the way to Pre- City Market, where they were stopped about a mile. Just like today, attempting to smash someone's skull in with a club was illegal in Savannah's earliest colonial days. And nowadays, if you, if you do that and then chase them screaming, you'll kill them, you, you're going to go to jail. But there was no jail. Uh, in the early days for Mr. Williams to attend, but he was still in a lot of trouble. They had to put him under house arrest. They boarded up his windows and doors and made him stay inside for a few days to cool off and then pay off a fine. And I think there's something uh, interesting about that uh, because if you ever study crime, and and uh, there was a book when I was at the University of Georgia. I can't remember what the book was for the life of me. But one of the chapters was about crime during the colonial period. And I was amazed at the number of ads in newspapers for escaped murderers. I, I, I could not believe it. And when I read this story about how Mr. Williams went to jail and in house arrest, it all clicked. See, if you got into trouble in the 18th century in a big city like Boston, New York, Philadelphia, or Charleston, there was a jail for authorities to put you in if you were caught committing a crime. But if there was no jail in newer, smaller towns like Savannah, now if you had to cool off for a few days and pay a fine like Robert Williams, then that's no problem. But if you were put under house arrest and told, we're going to hang you on Tuesday morning, well, that's when the gears in your head might start moving. and You might instead decide to stay up all night, kick out a few boards out of the wall, and after everybody else has fallen asleep, try to run away west as fast as you can. Now, for what it's worth, I don't know what this says about the people who settled out west, but uh, there it is. Now, uh, let's see, where are we? Uh, now, you know, another interesting uh, thing about Savannah, there's a, a place called Johnson Square, one of the four original squares uh, downtown. And mind you, Spanish moss, a, a plant, uh, coats everywhere, everything, every tree in Savannah, except for whatever reason, there is no Spanish moss in Johnson Square. And... Many people say that the reason for this is supernatural. Johnson is one of the four original squares. It dates all the way back to 1733. And for many years, it was the old hanging square in Georgia. Now, the first two people hanged in Georgia were Alice uh, Riley and Richard White. Two, Richard and Alice, were they were two Irish indentured servants. Now, their indentures were purchased by uh, an older colonist named William Wise, who apparently was not a very good person. Uh, and to make a long story short, Uh, The English and the Irish haven't always gotten along very well anyway. And many of the Irish indentured servants were Catholic and suspected of having sympathies to Catholic Spain and La Florida. Um, And so life as an indentured servant was difficult in Georgia. Um, These people arrived in Savannah having to sign a contract to work for a period of time, often seven years in exchange for 50 acres of land at the end of the indenture. They lived in small huts, sometimes sharing them with other families, so that sometimes, sometimes as, perhaps as many as 20 people would live in one home that was perhaps uh, 12 by 16 feet. Um, 
this actually all sounded like a pretty good deal to most of the lower classes of London who were by and large living in horrifyingly overcrowded conditions to the extent that sometimes perhaps 30 or 40 individuals might be living in a in a similarly sized home or apartment uh, and in those sorts of situations you're probably going to die of tuber tuberculosis now unfortunately for the indentured servants who came to the new world the average lifespan of something moving here was only about five years and so many of those hoping to attain 50 acres never lived to see the fruits of their labors now with all that said uh the, the Irish could be uh, mistreated so terribly in Savannah. Um, there was even a, suppo a, a possible plot called the Red String Conspiracy. It was foiled. Um, but, uh, and I, I apologize, I don't, we don't know much information about it except for that it was reported one night uh, in the 1730s. Um, that the that Irish indentured servants were uh, basically forming an alliance with the Creek Indians and were going to kill all the English, uh, and this did not happen, uh, obviously. But uh, they, they t the English took this very seriously. Um, at any rate, William Wise, uh, back to him, treated Richard and Alice like animals. He often kept them chained up outdoors to the outhouse uh, where they slept. Um, outdoors uh, once a month he bathed and when he did so he would force Alice to help by combing and brushing his long stringy gray hair Richard and Alice were revolted by this treatment as you might imagine but had little recourse um, in response uh, one night Richard crept into the room apparently while William Wise was bathing while Alice brushed his hair, and William, Richard White uh, strangled William Wise in the tub. And after that deed, Richard and Alice fled Savannah. But unfortunately for them, they were captured just three days later and brought back to Savannah. Now on the same day that they were returned, Richard White was taken out to Johnson Square and hanged from the neck until he was dead. Alice Riley was next, but she protested. You can't kill me. I'm pregnant. So she got to live for seven months. Two days after she gave birth to a baby boy, she was taken out to Johnson Square as well, and she became the first woman hanged in Georgia. The Bethesda Orphanage was not yet open, and her infant son died three days later of exposure. The child was left, apparently, out in the cold one night. Now, this is not Savannah's proudest moment. No matter what you think about what I'm going to tell you, it is a true story, however. But some folks claim that there has been no Spanish moss growing in Johnson Square ever since that day when Alice Riley was hanged. They say that is because Alice is still there, and that the Spanish moss so reminds her of that villain William Wise's long, stringy gray hair that she picks it out, unable to stand it. <laughs> now, I think that's a pretty good story might even be my favorite story to tell people who ask me about Colonial Savannah. Now, I don't tell them about the real reason there is no Spanish moss in Johnson Square, though. Now, I do know the real reason why there is no Spanish moss in Johnson Square, but I am not at liberty to say. However, if you wish to know the answer, you may join me on the History of the Atlantic Worlds podcast Maiden Voyage on a trip to Savannah. Uh, when we take our first uh, vacation, which I believe will be in February of 2020, um, I promise there to unveil the secret. So uh, keep a, a lookout, and at any rate, on uh, our Facebook page and on more podcasts for more information about that. But I think uh, we're going to take a winter trip uh, there uh, to see some really neat stuff. Now... Uh, I mentioned something called Spanish moss. Uh, Spanish moss is neither Spanish, mind you. It's also not a moss. It's an epiphyte or a plant that grows on another plant. Now, it has no roots. 
And so it doesn't damage the, the trees on it inhabits. Um, it instead gets its nutrients from water vapor, uh, which is plentiful in the humid Georgia environment. Um, and as such, it loves to live, especially on the oak trees um, of, of, of Georgia, because the oaks have such long branches, which really allows the moss to stretch out and get plenty of airflow. Um, it was named way back in the 16th century. Uh, when a French fur trapper saw it in Louisiana. After sailing down the Mississippi River, uh, he noted that it looked like the beard of a Spaniard. Um, now, for their part, the Spanish actually called it Frenchman's beard. And now, personally, uh, whenever I saw Spanish moss, I was reminded of ZZ Top, so I suppose it's okay to see whatever you want up there. Now, it is actually safe to grab Spanish moss out of trees, but I do not ever recommend picking it up off the ground. Uh, there's a species of mite called the chigger or the red bug that inhabits coastal Georgia. They are related to ticks and fleas and live on the ground and if one jumps up and bites you on the ankle, it isn't that bad. Maybe a little worse than a mosquito. But they are known to infest patches of Spanish moss left laying on the ground. And I've seen a woman pick up Spanish moss off the ground, wrap it around her neck like a boa and I promise you, if 40 or 50 red bugs were chomping into your neck all at the same time, you would have a very, very bad day. But it is safe to grab it off the trees. The, the little buggers don't climb. Now, it's actually much softer than other materials the colonists had at their disposal for bedding. So as a result, in the 1700s, the colonists of Savannah used Spanish moss uh, to, to stuff their mattresses and pillows and, and whatnot. Uh, they learned to be careful because of the chiggers. They would boil and smoke the moss first. Uh, you know, don't let the bed bugs bite. Now, the colonists uh, and, um, actually, uh, uh, blah, 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 excuse me, the colonists were not the only ones to use Spanish moss. And in the 20th century, uh, if we can go forward again, I apologize. Um, Henry Ford was using Spanish moss to stuff the seat cushions of the Model T, just like the colonists of Savannah had done in years past. Well, not exactly that way, uh, because he was not properly cleaning the moss like the colonists had been, and as a result, bugs inside of the seats of the Model T were the very first cause of the very first recall on the very first automobile. Many disgruntled customers swore they would never give Henry Ford another cent after this. And in fact, well, we still know Henry Ford, though, because he was such a great salesman. And I have to tell you this, because he managed to win a lot of those customers back. And that's because he did this by poking fun at himself a little bit. See, all around the country, Henry Ford began putting up billboards. And they all read the same thing after this recall, asking us a very important question. Aren't you itching for a Ford? <laughs> well, let's uh, continue. As we, I gotta get off the. I apologize for talking about plants for the last ten minutes. I, I there's something, something wrong with me. Uh, now, what, when the cotton gin was invented, the cotton plantation became the symbol of wealth in much of the southeast. But, but in the years before that, the quickest way to wealth in Georgia was to become multilingual, to move out west into creek country, and to hunt for deer. The average hunter might get 50 or 60 male and 50 or 60 female deer each winter. This was a huge sum of money, because in 1740 a brown bess smoothbore musket could be purchased in downtown Savannah for 17 buckskins. And in fact, the wealthiest person in Savannah in colonial Georgia was involved in the deerskin trade, Though what many people didn't realize was that the wealthiest person in Georgia is a, was a woman, and an Indian woman at that. Her name was Mary Musgrove, and this is her story. Well, it's also the story about the day that a man named John Williams tried to shoot her. Now, Mary Musgrove was the daughter of an, of an English trader named Thomas Griffin, and a Muscogee Indian woman related to Brims, who was the Grand Miko of all Creek tribes. Mary spoke English and Muscogee. She traveled seamlessly between two worlds, red and white. Uh, she married a Scottish fur trader named John Musgrove in 1717 and began to learn the intricacies of the fur trade economy 
of early 18th century America. Now, John Musgrove died in 1735, and because of this, Mary was able to take the reins of the company, and she controlled the deerskin trade in and out of Georgia. She owned a trading post named Cowpens that sat along the Savannah River about four miles from the city. Hunters there sold their skins to Mary, which she later took into town to sell onto ships headed for Europe. Her wealth was further supplemented by the wages she received she received in exchange for acting as the principal interpreter to Oglethorpe and the trustees from 1734 to 1744. In fact, Mary Musgrove grew so wealthy that by the end of her life, the colonists were calling her the Empress of all the Creek Indians. Now, for the record, the Creek Confederacy has never recognized any emperors or empresses that I am aware of, but if you make enough money, people will call you whatever you want them to. Now, Mary profited on both ends of the deerskin trade. Now, hunters could purchase licenses at her store that allowed them to hunt on her lands. And in fact, Mary's prosperity can't really be measured in buckskins alone. Because to really understand how wealthy she was, we have to talk about that land. See, the leading men of Georgia who came across the Atlantic with the Georgia Trust each owned 500 acres of land, like Noble Jones, for example. The lower Creek chief Malachi granted Mary Musgrove, Osaba, Sapelo, and St. Catherine's Islands, and the combined acreage of these three is about 15,000 acres. That's how wealthy you could get by being involved in the deerskin trade. Now, Mary may not have been an actual empress, but she did threaten to let loose actual dogs of war. In 1749, the British refused to respect the land she was granted, and she led more than 200 Creek warriors into Savannah to fight for their liberties. She did not stop fighting the British from trying to steal her land, in fact, until 1760, when she made a deal with Royal Governor Henry Ellis, where Mary retained control of St. Catharines and in compensation received 2,100 pounds for relinquishing her claim over Osaba and Sapelo Islands. She died on St. Catherine's Island sometime after 1763. Now, I tell you about Mary Musgrove, not just because she was the wealthiest person in early Georgia, but also because I want to tell you about the time that someone tried to shoot her. John Williams believed that Mary Musgrove was cheating him. Rightly or wrongly, he marched four miles up the Savannah River to Cowpens, to Mary Musgrove's trade shop with his brown best flintlock musket. He kicked in the front door and said, Mary Musgrove, you've cheated me for the last time. With that, he pointed and fired to kill. Now, the long land pattern smoothbore flintlock musket was first issued to British troops in 1722 and remained the weapon of choice for the British Empire until 1838 when it was finally supplanted by percussion cap technology. Because long land pattern smoothbore flintlock musket is a bit of a mouthful, soldiers nicknamed the firearm Brown Bess instead. Fl flintlock muskets were far safer to use than matchlock weapons, but it was also very dangerous to be on the receiving end because it featured a 75 caliber bore firing a projectile large enough to sever limbs and cause massive da damage. It was fireable up to four times per minute by well-drilled soldiers and was deadly at 400 yards. It retains the distinction to this day of being the longest-serving firearm in military history. The brown bass, however, is not an accurate weapon. Smoothbores, unlike rifled weapons, do not fire bullets. Rifling allows bullets to spin in a similar fashion to a football thrown in with a spiral. Smoothbores are not rifled and fire musket balls, not bullets. When the musket is fired, the explosive force of the gunpowder sends a musket ball bouncing down the barrel. If the ball hits the left side of the barrel before exiting, it will go right, right will go left, up is down, down is up. The result is is that the brown bess was only accurate to about a quarter of its full range, and in fact a marksman of the 18th century was someone who had this distinct honor of having hit a six-foot 
by six-foot wooden board from a distance of 50 yards. John Williams did not hit his mark. And Mary Musgrove was not the sort of per woman you pointed a musket at and did not kill. She rushed Williams, wrestled the weapon from him, and began beating him with it. She attacked him with such ferocity that by the time she was finished, the musket was bent in half. Now, when I read that story, I flat out did not believe it. I said to myself, setting the book down, she didn't hit him that hard, and thought nothing else of it. But I have to tell you that on October the 19th of 2012, I was at the Rail Pub on Congress Street, just outside of City Market in the historic district of downtown Savannah, Georgia. I was celebrating my birthday, and I ran into a friend, John Brannan. John Brannan is an archaeologist, and in 2002, he and a team of archaeologists got to do a dig up the Savannah River because the Georgia Ports Authority was expanding, and amongst the things that the archaeologists discovered was Mary Musgrove's trade shop. Two things from that conversation with John have always since stuck with me in my head. First, that even though James Oglethorpe banned hard spirits in Savannah, the back wall of Mary's trade shop had somewhere between 200 and 250 bottles of rum for sale. Second, that the barrel of a brown best flintlock musket bent at nearly a 90 degree angle was found in the ruins of cowpens. When John told me about that, my jaw dropped so far it must have hit the table. Perhaps Mary really did hit him that hard, after all. Now, I think we need to talk before we... Uh, I want to talk about a few more things. I Definitely, we need to talk a little bit about more slavery uh, and, the, and the failed experiment that is the, the, the banning of slavery in Georgia. I uh, see, Georgia is situated just south of Charleston and north of the British Caribbean. And because of this, I think the idea that it could ever flourish as an anti-slavery colony is really kind of doomed to failure because that's just simply too utopian of an idea. The poor colonists of Georgia could go across the border and see the wealth their neighbors possessed. Charleston at that time was the wealthiest of the British colonies in North America, and almost immediately a pro-slavery faction named the Malcontents took hold in the colony sending letters urging the trustees to reconsider their position. By the late 1730s, Noble Jones had surveyed the town of Augusta along the Savannah River uh, and far to the northwest of British officials. A brisk slave trade with Carolina quickly developed. Jones himself is known to have owned seven slaves at least six months before it was legal to do so in the 1750s. In addition, Numerous British and Scottish traders were already inhabiting Georgia before Oglethorpe and the Georgia Trust debarked. They, alongside the Creek and Cherokee nations, had no such laws against slavery. And by the 18th century, Creeks and Cherokees were practicing both traditional forms of slavery as well as European forms of chattel slavery. Besides Savannah, and the other coastal fortified towns of Georgia, the Trust had no real way to enforce their anti-slavery laws. Before and during the years of the War of Jenkins' Ear, Georgia was able to receive aid from Parliament whenever the economy tanked, which was every year or two, because the trustees were able to raise the specter of an undefended Charleston. You wouldn't want Georgia to go under, because then there's no buffer between Charleston the wealthiest colony in America, is what the trustees would say. Once the war was over, and Georgia was firmly in the hands of the British, Parliament was no longer swayed by the trustees' arguments, and thus the trustees capitulated to the planter class, and slavery was made legal in Georgia. As if that wasn't enough, in a spectacular case of irony, the vast majority of malcontents were too poor and too in debt to be able to pursue their dreams of owning large plantations in Georgia even after, a, even after slavery was made legal. Instead, the sons of Carolina planters bought 
almost all of the huge tracts available along the Savannah River and elsewhere in Georgia, only two men besides Noble Jones already residing in Georgia were able to purchase slaves. Now, with that said, there was an there were there was a staunch anti-slavery uh, uh, opposition uh, besides the trustees, uh, and, and that was a group of Lutherans, the Salzburgers, who fled Salzburg, um, fleeing religious persecution, and under the leadership of one Friedrich von Recht, who settled west in of Savannah and formed the town of Ebenezer, which was far too swampy, and shortly afterwards to New Ebenezer, which was much better. Von Richt, in particular, is of note, uh, besides for leading the transatlantic voyage, for being the first skilled European artist to depict, to depict life in colonial Georgia. His depictions of the Muscogees in particular are useful to historians, showing details like the clothing they wore, muskets, and other tools they used, and some of the buildings they resided in. Now, the Salzburgers were very pious men and women, who, like the trustees, had serious moral problem with chattel slavery. Foreshadowing much more violence in America, in fact, the Salzburger Reverend Boltzius, who led the German anti-slavery crusade in Georgia, actually feared the malcontents would kill him, so deep was the rift between these two factions. Now, religious life in the early colony in general could be quite turbulent, as might be expected in the Wild West atmosphere of early Georgia. The first pastor who arrived with Oglethorpe and the original colonists died shortly after the colonists accidentally contaminated their own drinking water. So the colony went for a time without a professional minister, the second was young and on his first missionary position. His name was John Wesley, and one day in the future he would become rather famous for founding Methodism. His early years in Georgia, however, were far less successful and perhaps less pious. They seem to have served as a learning example for him, though. Wesley arrived in 1735 and became very unpopular shortly after. First off, he was a strict disciplinarian, and that didn't earn him many friends in the rough-and-tumble colony. Second, a very important duty of ministers on the frontier was the conversion of Indians. Wesley hated spending time with the Creeks, preferring to spend his time in town. All of this in earned him scorn, in particular, from John Williams. Yes, the same John Williams who was beaten up by Mary Musgrove. Williams, in addition to that sometimes got so drunk that he would stumble through town naked and sometimes would perform mock baptisms of infants and Native Americans in order to poke fun at Wesley. Well, perhaps, though, the reason that Williams was forced to do this was because Wesley was too busy being in love. He was courting the daughter of a local magistrate. Her name was Sophia Hopke, but Hopke ended up marrying another man. And what, undoubt what followed is undoubtedly the greatest scandal of colonial Georgia. Wesley refused to marry the pair, and when they returned from Beaufort, South Carolina after being wed there, Wesley refused to give them communion on the next Sunday's service and ended up being sued by the groom. And so, after that uh, episode, on December 2nd, 1737, 1737 excuse me, Wesley hung a letter on the hanging tree in Johnson Square, stating how glad he was to be done with Georgia, and that he was shaking the dust from his boots, and that he would never be in this accursed place again. Afterwards, Wesley climbed aboard a ship and left Georgia in disgrace. Now, the next minister in Georgia was also famous, but this time famous before arriving. He was the renowned uh, George Whitfield, famed evangelist of the Great Awakening, was brought to Georgia by the trustees the next year in 1738. Wesley, noticing the problem of disease, especially malaria and yellow fever, which had both become endemic to Georgia, had the idea to create an orphanage for boys in Georgia, since yellow fever is particularly fatal to adults, leaving Georgia with a large orphan population. Now, the quest for funding for this venture brought Wesley into contact with Benjamin Franklin, and the two became friends. Franklin, for his part, perhaps the least religious of the founders beside Thomas Paine, 
did not disapprove of the design, but as Georgia was then destitute of materials and workmen, it was proposed to send them from Philadelphia at a great expense. I thought it would have been better to have built the house here, Philadelphia that is, and brought the children to it. This I advised, but he was resolute in his first project and rejected my counsel, and I thereupon refused to contribute. Now, I want to say that I would never have grown up in Georgia, would not have been able to tell this story, would not be, have attended the University of Georgia. My whole life would be different had not Wesley later convinced Benjamin Franklin to found Bethesda in Georgia. And that's because my father got a job teaching English at Bethesda in the early 90s, and we moved there. Uh, anyway, well, I want to give us... Um, a little more information about when Wesley and Franklin meet after this. This is from Franklin's autobiography, uh, by the way. Um, and this is the meeting where uh, Franklin will be convinced to help fundraise for Bethesda. Quote, he had a loud and clear voice and articulated his words and sentences. He is speaking of, of, of Wesley Franklinist. He was speaking, articulated his words and sentences so perfectly that he might be heard and understood at a great distance, especially as his audience, however numerous, observed the most exact silence. He preached one evening from the top of the courthouse steps, which are in the middle of Market Street and on the west side of 2nd Street, which crosses it at right angles. Both streets were filled with his hearers to a considerable distance. Being among the hindmost in Markham Street, I had the curiosity to learn how far he could be heard by retiring backwards down the street towards the river, and I found his voice distinct till I came near Front Street, when some noise in that street obscured it. Imagining then a semicircle, of which my distance should be the radiance, and that it were filled with audience, to each of whom I allowed two square feet, I computed that he might well be heard by more than 30,000. This reconciled me to the newspaper accounts of have, his having preached to 25,000 people in the fields, and to the ancient histories of generals haranguing whole armies, of which I had sometimes doubted. I tell you, there is really just nothing like Ben Franklin. Um... He goes to a sermon and promptly does a science experiment. <laughs> Franklin also noted that Whitfield could be incredibly persuasive. For soon after having made the decision to not help Whitfield in his quest, Franklin, quote, happened soon after to attend one of his sermons, in the course of which I perceived he intended to finish with a collection, and I silently resolved that he should get nothing from me. I had in my pocket a handful of copper money, three or four silver dollars, and five pistoles in gold. As he proceeded, I began to soften, and I concluded to give the coppers. Another stroke of his oratory made me ashamed of that, and determined me to give the silver, and he finished so admirably that I emptied my pocket wholly into the collector's dish, gold and all. Whitfield was quite a, quite a talker. Um, but they don't really make, they just don't make religious people like they used to. I, I, his famous speech, his famous, um, uh, his, his really famous, um, excuse me, sermon is called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And it is hard to explain, if you read it, why it was so powerful to people back then. Because Unless you understand how much closer people were to dying in the 1700s. And how unexpected and sudden death could be. Um, Whitfield compares men to insects held 
uh, by the legs and God by God is holding us as an insect over the open fire. And one day, no matter what you do, there is nothing you can do to stop this. God is going to toss you into the fire and poof, you are going to be burning for eternity and there's just nothing you can do to stop it. Whitfield would cry and, and plead with the audience as he, as he told them this. And, and, and I think most people today, if they went to church and they heard that, they would go to a different church the next week. You know, maybe one with a band. Um, but that's because nowadays we're not really worried about... You know, when you heard that in the 1700s, uh, let me put it to you this way. When you heard that in the 1730s, you, you might nod along, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we better get down and repent right away and beg for mercy. Because my sister died last week. She was healthy two weeks before. Uh, that's a sentiment that, that, that we don't really live with, that people in the past used to. At any rate, um, this, uh, the result of this somewhat unlikely partnership between uh, the sacred George Whitfield and the secular Ben Franklin ended in the creation of Bethesda Home for Boys, the oldest orphanage in North America. Now, the or orphanage is still in operation today. Uh, it later received a large grant from the British Crown and has prospered as a result. Now, nowadays, most of the inhabitants of Bethesda actually are not orphans. Most are sentenced to live there by a judge until their 21st years, year of age. Um, it, the home serves a dual purpose since the United States produces fewer orphans than it once did. And a number of young men with troubled upbringings have come to stay there after repeatedly getting in trouble. Um, often these problems stem from uh, broken homes and abuse, things uh, most people don't deal with as children. I know this uh, because in, when in 1992 my father began working as an English teacher there, the school was year-round. And in the summer, me and my brother uh, spent a lot of time there. Uh, since my family moved here from Virginia, but because my father got that job, I think it is safe to say that this episode, and perhaps the entirety of the podcast, would not be possible. Except that George Whitfield convinced Benjamin Franklin to help fund the venture. Thanks, and God bless you, Mr. Whitfield. Now, numerous young men grew up in Georgia after having been educated and having learnt a trade at Bethesda. One of them is was Peter Tondi. Bethesda was about a mile or two from Noble Jones's fortified plantation house, and the road went from one place to the other, and so it is likely that Peter Tondi spent at least some of his youth learning his trade from Noble Jones. By adulthood, he owned his own tavern downtown, Tondi's Tavern, which became very notable uh, as the years went on and the revolution neared, and that's because the royal governor, of Georgia banned public meetings in the early 1770s. And so afterwards, the Liberty Boys, Georgia's chapter of the Sons of Liberty, met in secret at Tondi's Tavern. Peter Tondi repeatedly, reportedly kept a list and stood outside the door, and if you weren't on the list, you couldn't get in to hear the meeting. As such, he serves a special distinction in Savannah, a city of lax, open container laws, and full of bars and clubs, a place where a man or woman can walk proud and free from one establishment to another with a drink in their hand. Peter Tondi was Savannah's first bouncer. Now, one of the people in attendance at the meetings at Tondi's would have been Noble Jones' son, Noble Wimberly Jones whose father was a loyalist and would be until he died, but Noble Wimberly was one of the firebrand leaders of Georgia's revolutionary movement and the leader of the Liberty Boys. In fact, when Noble Jones and his, excuse me, when Noble Wimberly and his friends found out about the Boston Tea Party and that their compatriots in Massachusetts had gotten together, uh, had, had sent a shipment of tea into the harbor, the Liberty Boys decided to join in on the fun. One night they got together, got drunk, and robbed the gunpowder magazine of all the gunpowder and shipped most of it north. Lexington and Concord were fought with powder stolen by Noble Wimberly Jones and the Liberty Boys of Savannah. Now, Noble Wimberly did not end up signing the Declaration of Independence, uh, instead staying and caring for his uh, father and the family estate, which was over 5,000 acres by the time Noble died on the eve of the Revolution in 1775. 
After the British victory at the Battle of Savannah, Noble Wimberley actually fled to Charleston, but was captured there when the city was also taken at a low point in the Revolution, uh, well, at least from the side of the, the Patriots. Um, and he ends up dying, um, in, although he lives, and he ends up dying in 1805. Noble Wimberley Jones was, uh, I think, one year old. Um, when the ship got here, he was the last of the original colonists. Uh, yeah, quite a quite a quite a history. Um, now I think I'm gonna end uh, here us here with one more story because um, I, I didn't even really mean to get into the revolution much. Um, when we take our first uh, history vacation, the and we're gonna into Savannah, Georgia. I think I'm going to publish our first two live podcasts, which will be The War of Jenkins' Ear and Revolutionary Georgia during the Revolution. I don't know what the title is for that one yet. Um, and I don't know if that's going to be in February 20, 2020 or possibly February 2019, but I, I'm going to guess 2020 uh, will be the time by the time we can get that organized. Um, at any rate, um, let's end it, though, with one, one more um, and this is kind of revolutionary, too, so I, I just lied to you. Um, now, Noble Wimberley was captured at the, in the city of Charleston with a lot of, of revolutionaries who had fled Savannah, um, including my favorite veteran of the Revolutionary War. And while much of the time I try to treat history with irreverence, now is probably not the time for total irreverence. And that's because the tale I'm going to tell you is heroic and tragic. And because of that, this man deserves our respect as a veteran of the United States military. They called him Cocktat Sheftal, and his experiences at war left him insane. He also had, though, what I believe to be the greatest day that anyone has ever had. And I want to leave you with that. It is my greatest hope that each of you listening to this gets to experience a day just as good as the greatest day of Cocktail Cheftal's life, although preferably without having to suffer through the torture first. And now, Cheftal went to war when he was only 16 years old, along with his two brothers and his revolutionarily spirited father, Mordecai Cheftal. Now, unfortunately for the young man, he was captured at Charleston and spent the next two years of his life at sea. Prisoner of war aboard a aboard a British warship stationed off the coast of Antigua. Malnourished and at times tortured, Cocktat Cheftal was never the same after the war, though I have a theory that he was always crazy, and that's because his given name was Cheftal Cheftal. And really, what kind of parents would do that to their child? Now anyway, Cheftal lived on Telfair Square, and after the war until his death in 1829, he never took off his military uniform. His tricorn hat always cocked to the side, hence the nickname. Mind you that for the last 20 years of his life, American society had abandoned the knee-high breeches that he wore and, and, and were instead wearing full-length trousers. I, I think the expression that might have best fit Sheftal were he alive today might be that he was stuck in the 70s. The 1770s, that is, not the, not the 90s. He, he reportedly paced back and front on his front porch every day, keeping Savannah safe. He paced so frequently that while his home still existed, it was possible to see where his footsteps had started to wear through the floorboards of his porch. And in fact, on the day of his death, he was discovered to be deceased when one of his neighbors remarked, Hey, where's Cocktail Cheftal? He's not marching. Now, so with all that said, Mr. Sheftal did not have the best life in the world. His experiences at war left him scarred, I think, and, uh, you know, with a screw loose. But before years, before he died, Sheftal Sheftal had what is arguably the greatest day that anyone who has ever lived has ever got to experience. Because in that year, in 1825, Savannah got to host a very special guest. The Marquis de Lafayette was touring Savannah on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence 
of the signing of the Declaration of Independence and came to Savannah to give a speech in Johnson Square. The French nobleman had come to America because he believed in liberty and served under George Washington and spoke eloquently for an hour. At the end of the speech, the crowd cheered huzzah and tossed their hats into the air, despite the fact that the speech was in French and almost no one in attendance understood a word what the Marquis had said. But hey, this was the hero of two worlds over here. Finally, at the end of the speech, the Marquis made a request. He desired to see the remaining veterans of the revolution that were in Savannah. Now, never a hotbed of revolutionary activity. Only eight veterans remained in the city and that were alive 50 years after the start of the war. Now, of these eight men, seven of them rushed home as quickly as possible to change into their uniforms. Sheftal, Sheftal, of course, was already in his uniform. He did not need to change. The eight men then stood in formation as the Marquis greeted and thanked them, each for their service. And when the aged Frenchman got to Sheftal, he stopped. He squinted and he, and he pointed a finger at Sheftal. In his broken English, he spoke, I, I remember you. Sheftal Sheftal had served under the Marquis for less than two weeks before being captured. And 50 years later, it meant the world to him that he had been remembered. The smile on Sheftal's face was reportedly so wide and so bright that it was recorded into history. And in fact, it was reported that for the last four years of his life that you could not knock the smile off of his face if you tried. I don't know who goes around trying to knock a smile off the faces of old veterans, but we'll... I, let's just, I'll just leave that there. Um, so, like I said, uh, I, I think that's going to be that. That'll be it for today. Um, we've we've already uh, this is already two hours long. <laughs> um, we'll continue this story uh, in Savannah when we visit that uh, that beautiful city and publish our first two live podcasts: War of Jenkins here and Revolutionary Georgia. And so, this uh, finally concludes our three part introduction to the history of the Atlantic world. Now, our next few episodes will work our way towards Columbus. And we're going to I'm going to focus largely on uh, uh, what Spain and Portugal are up to in the years leading up to that. Uh, so with that said, um, we're going to start the main story of the history of the Atlantic world uh, with our next episode, which will focus on the medieval beginnings of Spain and Portugal and the conquistadors who, during the 16th century, will eventually turn the whole world upside down. Now, with all that said, thank you. So long. And uh, thanks for all the fish. And what I say, the captain is a tyrant and I no longer obey. I'm sick of taking orders from the madman in command. So let's stop him on an island and leave him in the sand. Cause it's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. And now we're taking over the ship. It's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. And now we're taking over the ship. What's happening here? You're no longer in control, and we're drinking up your beer. This is now a democratic, eagerly tearing pirate ship. So enjoy your trip, oh. 'cause it's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. This is a mutiny, and now we're taking over the ship. It's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. It's a mutiny, and now we're taking over the ship.